Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kimberly Cook. Um, I will be one of your moderators for this session. Uh, my colleague, Ina Cooper, Ina Cooper, will also be here as well. Um, and we are very excited to talk about challenges in curating interdisciplinary data in the biodiversity research community. Um, we're going to have a really rich discussion with a broad group of panelists. And I suppose we'll just get started. If I can change the slide here. Um, so we'll start out by sort of defining some terms, um, interdisciplinarity, uh, interdisciplinary and highly collaborative research. So the, the subject of our discussion today. Um, and then I'll introduce our panelists and I have a couple of guiding questions for them. And then uh, towards the very end, the last half hour or so, we'll have a QA and a with you, the audience, um, after getting to uh, know you guys a little bit. So to start off with, um, I would like to invite my colleague, Ina Cooper, to sort of give us a little bit of context behind this project. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ina Cooper, and I'm a research scientist at uh, Indiana University Bloomington in the US. So just, yeah. A bit of a context and the reason that we decided to do this panel is uh, that uh, Kimberly and I, we are part of the project and I'm the director of the project that focuses on data curation uh, for interdisciplinary and highly collaborative research. And we are working with seven very diverse projects uh, that we call use cases that come from uh, humanities, social sciences, environmental sciences, sciences and uh, several other areas and, and they are interdisciplinary teams and we are uh, working with them and observing them and uh, interviewing people on these teams and trying to document their practices uh, as they work with data and doing their research, trying to identify the challenges in their work. Uh, and uh, then our interest is in workflows. We want to document uh, their practices and then maybe come up with some recommendations. And we're finding that it's, um, it's, it's, it's challenging to uh, come up with recommendations and workflows for interdisciplinary research because it seems like each of them is, has its own specifics. Uh, but we're still, we're still working on finding some patterns and we thought that uh, the biodiversity community is also uh, a very interdisciplinary uh, group and it's, it would be interesting to talk about these challenges in connection to that, uh, to uh, the biodiversity uh, domain. But, to set sort of the context, I wanted to maybe share a few of our findings. So we're still uh, analyzing uh, our data and our interviews and observations, but some interesting things that we're finding, uh, first of all, the definitions of interdisciplinarity vary. And we find that not only in um, our, the way our uh, teams, the use cases work, but also in the literature. and. In addition to this sort of standard uh, focus on crossing the bound, the disciplinary boundaries and going uh, beyond uh, the uh, disciplinary domains, there are also several aspects of interdisciplinarity and collaborations that we see more and more of. And one of them is, of course, computational aspect and focus on collaborating with uh, computer scientists, data scientists, and uh, doing more and more sort of technologically uh, sophisticated work to analyze data. The other one is uh, what I would call data integration. So if you think about disciplines and uh, they are usually, you know, have their preferences in what type of data they collect and how they work with data. So more and more we see this emphasis on data coming from multiple sources and working with heterogeneous data and then the challenges that come with that. And finally, Another aspect that we also see uh, quite a bit of emphasis on is multiple stakeholders. So again, interdisciplinarity and collaboration is not only uh, sort of work among different types of researchers, but it's also other types of stakeholders, including working with, uh, I mentioned computer scientists and data scientists, but also librarians, data managers, and forming teams that, uh, that have various types of professions and various types of expertise that is needed to do this type of research. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of uh, you know, definitions uh, and I won't go into 
these standard, you know, there, there are these standard definitions of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. Uh, I think, you know, whatever terms people like to use, that's okay as long as we have a shared understanding. And that's one other aspect of the challenges of being in these collaborative teams is to develop some shared understanding of concepts and terminology. And um, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Uh, another interesting thing that we found is uh, we used uh, the life cycle, data life cycle models in our interviews and in our conversations. And it seems like they need to change. They need to accommodate uh, a very iterative and nonlinear way people work with data. Uh, many people in our teams commented that th this doesn't work that way. That doesn't work as a change from one stage to another. Uh, but then what does it mean for these models that we usually uh, rely on, especially in um, data management and data curation communities? Um, another one that I wanted to mention uh, is, uh, and, and it's, it kind of comes from the disciplinary work as well. We know that lack of attention to data management, especially early on, creates problems. And it seems like it creates even worse problems for interdisciplinary research. If people don't plan for how they're going to work with data during their you know, data collection, data processing uh, and analysis stages, then it creates many more problems with coordination, communication, and even processing the data and going through these multiple iterations of working with data. Um, metadata, of course, is a big challenge. And we know that it's a big challenge in disciplinary research, but it seems again, uh, it's even a bigger challenge in interdisciplinary research because we find it difficult to come up with recommendations for what standards to use. And people usually don't like to use metadata standards anyway, but then when multiple domains uh, and data is being integrated, it's even harder to find ways to describe data. And then one of the things, um, kind of related to data management and metadata is that we see that there are some problems with data storage and especially for active work, uh, especially when collaboration goes beyond one institution. And there are, you know, many institutions work with their own data storage solutions. Uh, they seem to start breaking down when collaborations go beyond one institution in one country uh, in particular. So we, we're, kind of thinking about these challenges. And I hope that we could touch on those in this panel as well. Um, and finally, to kind of wrap up this brief introduction, uh, I think in thinking uh, about interdisciplinary and highly collaborative research, we really need more flexibility in data management and data curation. And that is related to several things, including the tools that we use and then the types of expertise that is being brought in uh, and the forms of support that these teams need. Um, but it also means that, you know, this flexibility, it may mean that we try to be sort of more diverse in uh, each person's or each team's expertise, but it also could mean more specialization and then more trust in what other colleagues on these teams are doing. So these are just some quick points, you know, that come from, uh, our project and uh, that I think might be relevant to this panel and I'm sure we'll have uh, many more interesting points to discuss as our panelists uh, talk about their projects and work. Awesome, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ina. Um, so yeah, so that was just a brief introduction, um, just broadly defining these interdisciplinary um, and collaborative research projects. Uh, but in this discussion, uh, we sort of thought that it might be nice to narrow our focus to thinking about biodiversity science. Um, and this is really important, um, I think, specifically because we're going into this more global, um, comprehensive understanding of the state of biodiversity in the face of environmental change, right? So not only do we need to um, build collaborative efforts within, you know, geographic boundaries, but we're also working on international teams um, as well and building these uh, databases that sort of cross those cultural and geographic boundaries. Um, we also, in addition to that, um, 
Interdisciplinary biodiversity science enhances our ability to explore the interaction between biotic and abiotic factors. Um, so this, for example, would be a collaboration between, you know, a, a biology team and maybe an earth science team. Um, and the earth science team gives information about the, the geologic history of a particular area and the biologists um, give, you know, the biologic evolutionary history of a given area. And so this will help us build a better understanding of that interaction through space and time, and then also help us build an understanding of what will happen in the future. Um, and similar to that, um, a third point I think is important is thinking about this united effort between paleontology and, and neontological life sciences. So, I mean, there are a lot of challenges there, right? So these two different disciplinary communities think on different time scales, and so their data are going to be very different. Um, and their data are going to interact with each other uh, differently than they interact uh, within their own disciplines. Um, and so to give you, I guess, a little bit of uh, an example of maybe a neontological life science uh, IHCR project, our projects um, is the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. So these are long-term and the National Ecological Observatory Network. Um, so these are long-term networks that are um, built to build this interdisciplinary uh, understanding of our environment and our earth around us um, through time. And this requires not only collaboration between knowledge communities, but also like Eno was saying, the support of these um, interactions and collaborations. So not just researchers, but also the data managers, um, the librarians, um, computer scientists whose job it is to support the hardware and the software that supports the research. Um, so I think that's a really important point is that we're not just thinking about uh, papers and researchers collaborating and publishing papers. It's also about who those researchers are interacting with um, during their projects beyond academia. Um, so before I introduce our panelists, I would like to get to know you all a little bit better. Um, so I am going to switch my share screen. And we have a little bit of an audience poll. Um, I have a poll up here now. So you should see on your screen a QR code. Um, you can also use uh, this, this website. Can everybody see this screen? Yes, okay, yeah. um, yes. Yeah. On, the, on your right, you'll see a QR code that you can scan with your uh, smartphone, smart device, or you can go to this website on the left and type in this code. Um, so I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. Da -da. Um, so once you're in, um, I'd like to, you to answer this question here. So please tell us about your professional role. And it should update as you guys are entering answers. There we go. All right. Tim, too, too fast for me. Could you go back till I see the code, please? Yes. Um, oh, the code is actually at the top of the screen. Do you see it at the oh, very top? Hidden. In my view, I see. What is it? 2434? 2434-5047. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so this is producing a word cloud. Um, so the larger the words, the more common the term. Um, we've got data manager right smack dab in the middle, if that is not surprising. Um, taxonomists, data curators, informatics expert, data architect. Um, wow, lots of data oriented. I see, I saw a postdoc somewhere, a curator, Batman. <laughs> Uh, that's good for you. <laughs> um, genomic data curators. So yeah, so we have these data curators who are focused specifically on a particular type of data. Um, and that's an important distinction. Data scientists. <laughs> these are great. Standardization officer. That's awesome. I love, I love standards. Plant monog monographer, monographer, librarian, leader, I like that. Leader is good. Geneticist, wow, these are great. And you can see uh, we have 
quite the interdisciplinary community here at Tadwig, just naturally. Um, I think that says a lot about um, this community. Data cleaner, flora, people who work with plants, herbarium technician. Wow. So it looks like it's stabilized a little bit. Um, so yeah, so we have a lot of folks focused on data, um, focused on particular types of data, and uh, some sort of disciplinarily focused folks. Taxonomies. Yeah, all right. Um, so we'll move on to this next question. Uh, please describe your research discipline field of expertise. And this should be the same code, 2434504747. Computer science, entomology, unsurprising, accounting. I want to talk to that person about their data. <laughs> Taxonomy, paleontology, databases, biodiversity, informatics, and that computer science is still pretty big. Biogeography, after my own heart. <laughs> Plant identification, Let's see. paleobiology, software engineering, that is very important. These are all important, but. Geneticists, botanists, ecology, genomics, landscape ecology, arachnology, spiders, see ichthyology, proteins, people working on the molecular level. Yeah, so as I said before, um, Different disciplines will have these different thought processes that they think about their data. So someone who studies uh, molecules and something on that scale is going to think about data differently than someone who studies landscape ecology and biogeography. Yes, Ina uh, just pointed out that you we see that um, interdisciplinarity goes beyond disciplines into various types of professional expertise. Um, it's a good way to put it. So software development, entomology, you can be a software developer and an entomologist. Wow, these are great. Give just a couple more seconds here. Keeps changing. So it looks like biodiversity, informatics, computer science, paleo, botany are at the heart taxonomy. It keeps changing, right? <laughs> DNA barcodes. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so yeah, so we'll keep this in mind as we're discussing with our panelists. Um, and we'll sort of re re revisit this uh, when we open up the, the questions to the audience um, at the end of the panel discussion. Do I see law? Interesting. Wow, awesome. All right, so I'm going to switch back to my other screen. Do, do, do. Switching back. All right. So I would like to introduce you to our panelists here. Um, can everybody see the screen in its entirety? You can't see my notes. No, okay, awesome. Um, so first off, we have Dr. Ann Tesson. She is a visiting associate professor at the University of Colorado and Schutz Medical Campus. Uh, she received her PhD in oceanography and shifted toward data science while working for the Encyclopedia of Life and the Census of Marine Life. Later on, she just she started her own data science consulting company and operated that for five years before joining the Translational and Integrative Sciences Lab under Dr. Melissa Handel. She currently works on developing semantic technology and knowledge graph methods for transdisciplinary data integration. So another one of those terms, transdis transdisciplinarity, um, subject of discussion here. So James Macklin, our next panelist, is a research scientist in botany and biodiversity informatics at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Ottawa. He is interested in the curation, digi 
curation, digitization, and mobilization of natural science collection data and its integration with other data resources. His research parallels the, the FAIR principles in making biodiversity data findable, so discoverable, openly accessible, interoperable, and reusable. He plays an active role in biodiversity standards development and has various roles contributing to the Biodiversity Informa Information Standards Organization, so TADWIG. Uh, he also currently leads several large projects involving specimen data mobilization and management, generating software to produce modern taxonomic works, genomic, mo genomic biomonitoring in support of soil health and water quality, and genomic adaptation and resilience to climate change. So very interdisciplinary person we have here. Our next pan panelist is Dr. Robbie Berger. He is an assistant professor at University of Kentucky. He joined the Faculty of Biology at the university this fall. Robbie is a biodiversity scientist, evolutionary ecologist, and macroecologist. His research combines theory with field studies and global data sets to uncover the broad scale patterns and processes underlying the diversity of life, as well as to use these macroecological rules as a framework to address practical issues in, in human and ecosystem health, biodiversity conservation, and sustainability. And last but not least, we have Ben Norton. Uh, he is head of technology, the collection. Head of Technology, Collections Data Curator, and Collections Manager of Mineralogy. His, uh, Ben's expertise resides in the convergence of information technology and scientific research, especially in the museum industry. Ben has worked in an array of scientific fields that include planetary science, mineralogy, ecology, meteorology, and biodiversity. In addition to data curation and research activities, Ben has two decades of experience building data-driven web-based technologies. As head of technology at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, he supports both day-to-day -day internal IT operations and long-term technological strategies. In addition, he is an active member, member of many project communities, inclu including current chair of the Specify Software Technical Advisory Committee. Every once in a while, Ben spends the day at a local elementary school as a substitute teacher. Um, so just a little bit about our panelists here. So as you can see, we have a broad swath of disciplines covered um, and we will get started. Um, before I start my questions, I would like to remind everybody who is a native English speaker to try to speak slowly. I have already broken this rule. Um, I will try my best to be better. Um, but yes, try to speak slowly and enunciate uh, for our non-native English speakers. So I'm going to stop my share now. Alrighty, so first off, my first question for you panelists is, how do you think, how do you think our field of biodiversity science benefits from interdisciplinarity and collaboration? So this is considering all elements of research, as we said before, so from data to the people who generated it. And whoever would like to go first, May. You should just pick somebody, Kim. All right, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did I know that would happen? So, I mean, I think it's very obvious that uh, biodiversity science is, you know, completely interdisciplinary by nature. Uh, it's, it strikes such a wide variety of questions and complexity that it can't possibly be done, you know, by, by any, it, it doesn't represent one science, really. Uh, let's put it that way. And uh, of course, it's so that diversity, you know, being inherent, uh, you know, it's not to say that we don't also still have silos, right? So, so we have disciplines that are siloed and, and the beauty of biodiversity science is that it tries to break down those silos because it needs to, it needs the expertise from each of those groups. And, and I think we've made great progress on that over the years, right? Um, and, you know, in its continuity, there are very different players. So there are data producers, there are people who are more interested in the curation of the data once it's generated. And there are the very uh, wide you know, difference of users on, on the other side. And I think that the key is that connectivity, right? We really want to maintain and do better at the connectivity of all those people who are relevant to the end game. You know, wh whatever evidence leads to the analysis and, and the research that gets done, everyone there participated in it, everyone there has ownership of it. And I think, you know, it's really important to remember that 
And of course, our community is now talking a lot more about attribution across that spectrum. So, you know, that's really important in a complex system. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there as my sort of high level comment. Awesome, thank you. Um, who else would like to answer this question who has prepared? I think James covered all the points. Sorry, Anne. It's, it's uh, <laughs> that's just inherent to the nature of the, the science we're trying to do, the scale of the science we're trying to do. Uh, necessitates a, a certain degree of crossing disciplinary boundaries in order to address the problems that we're being asked to solve. Well, I'm curious if people can think of some examples. You know, you all work on these very interesting, diverse projects. So if you think about examples, and, you know, uh, James, you mentioned attribution. So what are some of the aspects or progress that have been made in this area or you know, these different players, producers and users? So are there any examples where you can talk about how they come together and how they you know, work in this collaborative manner? I think it's a good question because I think interdisciplinary can mean a lot of things. I, I, don't, I actually don't think biodiversity is necessarily the most interdisciplinary um, field just because I mean you have things like astrobiology who you have like astronomers and biologists and you can't, you can't really get more diverse than these sort of geologists astronomers and biologists all sort of figuring out if you know life is going to live on Titan for example right and so then you have more small scale things like in the collections community I do a lot of camera trap stuff too and those two communities are pretty similar um, you know things are there's collections and there's acquiring data from uh, camera traps and so you have images that back up that data versus physical specimens and collections so there's a lot of continuity there in you know, overlap but I think any research, I mean, obviously, you know, science driven by new questions and new questions come from establishing new relationships and data. And so anytime we can establish new relationships and linkages from cross-disciplinary um, research, I think everyone benefits in general. But examples is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want yeah, Robbie so to get a chance to speak, but, uh, you know, I, I Go ahead, Robbie, and then I have a, an example of a, a nice one that I like to tell. Um, well, I'll just, uh, you know, talk about um, sort of some of the stuff that I'm involved in regarding like urban biodiversity, uh, you know, really sort of not only sort of the, um, the physical scientist and life scientist and, uh, and paleo scientists, but sort of you know, really extending to social scientists um, and economists and uh, and policymakers, you know, being able to combine biodiversity data with, for example, you know, uh, um, uh, urban cover maps globally and things like that. So, um, you know, really thinking about sort of the social science and, and also sort of the, uh, you know, policymaker side in terms of what, you know, what sort of resources can we provide for them, which, you know, both sort of, uh, I guess sort of theory as well as some understanding of the data to be able to um, you know, use that information and in how uh, they go about planning cities or whatever. So um, that's just one sort of project and, and topic that came to mind. So it's sort of this uh, feedback between, you know, Robbie, you mentioned physical science, but also these social sciences. Uh, everyone loves your cat, Robbie. Um, <laughs> so this feedback between this application of research, right? So Ina and I have also noticed that a lot of interdisciplinary research does have that element of application um, and the exchange between people who are applying new knowledge and people who are generating that new knowledge. Um, and having that sort of active node there where it's not just, you know, putting your research out there. It's like you're actually communicating with someone who is putting your, your stuff into action. Um, so I think that's, that's a very good example. 
So Jim, if I if if I can, I mean, I I have a nice story that sort of you know an interdisciplinary life, like sort of career changer necessarily or influencer that that's one that some people in this audience already know, but uh, it involves the the late uh, Bob Morris, who is a computer scientist uh, from from Boston, University of Massachusetts, and. Uh, Paul Morris, who's probably also in the group here, well-known uh, informatician in our, in our world. Uh, he and I, um, when we were at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and then we both uh, migrated to Harvard after that. Um, when we were there, we had a, a National Science Foundation grant to do some of the early work on uh, annotations, filter push, uh, as some people remember, and then into data quality. And uh, we got rejected the first uh, sort of first attempt uh, and the panel, what their main sort of thing was, hey, you know, you guys are talking a lot about things that are computer science related, yet you don't have any computer scientists. And uh, so we thought about that. And because we were, I mean, in Boston, where, where there's amazing resources, we got on to Bob Morris, who had been doing a little bit of biodiversity work. And that led us to include him. We got the grant and it was great. And one of the things that, that I, I remember classically him saying to Paul and I is that, well, you know, your real problem, James, is that you're both hacks. And, and he was right, you know? I mean, we, we were trying our best. We, you know, we, we had backgrounds doing coding, et cetera, but he really said, no, you need to take this, the work you're trying to do here, you need to take this professionally, you know, with computer scientists. And that led to an amazing, you know, sort of partnership and collaboration, which spread all out to many different places. So, you know, those kind of forceful, forced introductions, in this case, sort of, uh, you know, changed everything for me. And, and you know, what, what Bob uh, sort of underpinned has, has changed my career. So I guess the yeah, moral of that an, story is reaching out is important. That's an interesting example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think people talk in different ways about collaborations between what we traditionally called domain scientists and computer scientists or data scientists. And some of it is quite positive and some of it is not so positive. And sometimes, especially, you know, more and more now we hear that there's a tendency to sort of think about everything that as if it has a technological solution and then you know, computer scientists come and, and they, they will solve everything uh, and then kind of ignoring, you know, the underlying uh, behavioral, social, cultural issues. Um, but in our interviews, for example, what we found is that a lot depends on sort of the culture within the team and how relationships are organized and how people work together. And it could very well be productive collaborations or one sort of area of expertise could be taking over and ignoring the rest. So I wonder if people have thought that. I wonder if anybody said anything about intimidation, you know, where, you know, you're, you're crossing a boundary into a place you don't maybe know a lot about. And for some people that, that's hard to do, right? It takes a lot of listening and, and thinking. And I, I wonder if people, you know, curious what people think about that. So Ina, I've, definitely agree that um, you need to have some sort of almost like a collaboration handbook for these projects. And that's one thing that a lot of the large interdisciplinary projects that I've been working on has created. So in, in the beginning, when you first sit down to do your to, to start your project, you have a governance document where you assign roles and responsibilities and what happens if there's some sort of uh, disagreement that we can't resolve. What are the rules around authorship? How are we gonna share data with each other? How are we gonna keep in touch with each other after people leave the project? How are we gonna onboard new people? And it's really, important to set those sorts of rules and expectations in the very beginning and then revisit them maybe once a year, once every six months. We, we try to have something called a, a lemons to lemonade workshop where we ask people like what went well, what didn't go well, how can we make things better? Um, and that's really helped a lot, um, yeah. I think 
more, I, I think sometimes committees can be their own worst enemy in a way. Um, groups of people, I think sometimes when deliberations take place and there is not a lot of decision making, and I think a lot of that comes down to just sound leadership and, and things. I, so I, I teach um, kids uh, martial arts and self-defense and stuff. And so and part of the curriculum for kids is, is uh, leadership. And um, I can't tell you when I'm teaching a kid about leadership, you know, a 12 year old or 10 year old, and then I go to my professional environment and see somebody in leadership position that doesn't quite follow the same policies I'm trying to teach a 10, 10 year old about leadership, things become a bit questionable. And I, I think effective often, a lot of it because I'm decision making and effective leadership in these sorts of roles to maintain things and keep things accountable and make sure you can put the policy, but if nobody adheres to it, then it, it was good effort, but you really have to stick through it. And so, and that comes a lot from, from leadership. And so, and, and I've learned a lot. I mean, I think going, I mean, I can't tell you how much I've learned when I've gone out in the field. I mean, I can talk to camera trappers all day, but going out into the field with them actually mounting the cameras on the tree is always more effective. I've built a lot of software and I've sat in like, for example, vet services here in the museum, I've done a lot of internal stuff for a day because they were getting a new software system and I need to understand how they, what do they do with salamanders and snakes? I, mean, I have no idea, I have a dog, right? And so how do the medical records work and all that kind of stuff? And that stuff is so incredibly powerful. Um, but those facilitators that have the bandwidth to do that as well, is that not everybody has the bandwidth to know everything, right? I mean, research is to research and things like this. And I think facilitators and leadership are absolutely essential just because none of us can do everything. There's only 24 hours in a day, as much as some of us may not like that. And having those people that do that and facilitate that and cross boundaries are extremely important to cover that part of it. And then people can sort of focus on where their strengths are and things like that on projects. Yeah, I, I completely agree about the leadership part of that. And there's just not a whole lot of traditional methods to gain that sort of leadership training. And it takes a lot of emotional intelligence, which people tend to not really value in the scientific field. And um, it takes uh, a project, having a project manager, I think is super important. Um, and and uh, what happens a lot of times is someone is the leader because they're maybe the intellectual leader, but they're not really a very good operational leader. And um, we should, should recognize that and then figure out um, how to work around that. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, there's not like it, you, you know what I mean? Like just because the intellectual leader is often usually not, not the operational leader in, in many ways. And so, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. It's just understanding that from the outset, you know, instead of just giving somebody becomes a manager just because they've been around a long time, for example, that was probably, but I'll tell you the emotional intelligence thing in the private sector, a lot of times, especially in IT and things like that, it's even, it's even less so. There's actually probably more in the public sector just because of the way things work um, as far as job security and tenure and all those kinds of things. But, um, but yeah, there isn't a traditional, just like there's not, you know, science graduates are often not taught any computer skills in undergraduate things. They might be have one course, but a lot of, you know, people come out without any technical skills just because they, they took labs, right? And it's not, it's not there. And so where do you pick up those skills along the way? So we have some questions that are, that are coming from people. I don't know, Kimberly, what do you think? Should we uh, read them mm -hmm. as we go in our discussion? Uh, they are on Hoover. I can, I can read them. It's this Q&A tab. Um, yeah, we but can, I think it's... We can do... We can do a couple and then uh, we can move on to the next questions since it seems like this is a hot topic. <laughs> well, I mean, one of them was relevant to what James was talking about, you know, users and producers of data. And someone asked, uh, given the interdisciplinary nature of the field, how did you gauge who the end users of your biodiversity projects are, who are benefiting from what we do, the general public, some types of experts or others. So I, I, just, I just thought that that's interesting. Yeah, James. Well, and, and I would say that that is a place that we maybe don't do the best job. And, and I have sort of hit this uh, hard in a couple of projects that I, I've been leading that have strong, because I work for government and because the way the funding comes and users are and, and knowledge transfer is key. Right? So you spend a lot more time with your end users and you spend time with those end users at the beginning. So before you start your project, you're supposed to understand what are you transferring? So yes, you're doing basic research and that's essential, right? And everybody understands that, but translating that to a way that in my case, Canadians benefit from it. Well, you know, that, that's a very different thing. And, and it comes back to the training part is, well, scientists like me, I was never trained to do that kind of engagement. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I can talk to people. I, I know things. 
but there are there's a real education behind knowing how to transfer things to audiences you know very different audiences i mean we're all seeing indigenous engagement as you know a major thing around the world and indigenous engagement is not easy uh, and it's something that takes time and patience and these are things that you know may not be the thing that you want me to do we need a we need me to transfer knowledge to that to the, the middle person and and the translator who then is able to go to the end user so i think it is something we need to be much more aware of especially if you touch you know those kind of research projects that that have that end i'll take example. so I, I built a, a small module for security staff here in the museum so they can check in when they go check out exhibits and uh so i went around with them and walked around with them to see what they were doing and um I, and it's a mobile friendly because they're on their phones they're sort of checking these exhibits and and i thought i, I kind of had a design done and i put some together and then one of the guys who's a little older had his phone and I looked at it and his letters and his words were so big on his phone. <laughs> that it's like four words on the screen. And I did not anticipate that. So I had to go back and I just didn't think of it. Right. Like, how do you like it's huge, man. And so I had to go back and actually like change the interface just because this guy because he has to use it. That's, who, that's who's using it. Right. I, I might think this is nice, but if he can't if it's all crammed and he can't do anything, that's pointless, right? And so I had to go back and actually redesign the interface. So, because he wasn't the only one, a lot of them had this like zoom in on their little phones and it was really good. But just that basic knowledge, I mean, made the, all the difference in the world, you know, because now they can actually use the software and just go around walking. So it's really important. So do you think biodiversity is an area has sort of an increased connection or emphasis on these so-called end users as you know, citizens or lay people compared to other areas. Because if you think I about should. astrophysics, it's more about education, yeah. right? About astrophysics, but I would say biodiversity is different and it has a more direct connection to people's lives and, and maybe you get a different relationship. Um, no, well, with that's certainly especially true. Climate change, I mean, as soon as you say climate change, you know, everybody, everybody wants to know something uh, and different kinds of things and, and our fake news world, you know, and, and the evidence that we provide. But I, I was going to say that uh, I think Robbie's example of, you know, an urban, working in an urban environment, you, you touch citizens, right? The people who care uh, and, and that must be uh, important as, as an end use. The subject matter is popular. People like deer and buddy rabbits and <laughs> trees and things. You know what I mean? I mean, climate change, those people have it hard. I worked in a climate change agency for a couple of years and like they, because everybody has an opinion and it's under scrutiny constantly. And it happened during climate change I was working in it and it's, they have very challenging. You know, how do you even talk to the public? Like, what do you even say? Like, do you say anything? Do you know, you know? and uh, they have very difficult things. But astrophysics, the term itself is intimidating to people, right? Like, it's astrophysics. Like, I don't know what that is. What's the what galaxies and planets far away? You know what I mean? And Bottoris just has that advantage of having things that people can see and, and they like and it's more popular. Unless you hate deer. Yeah, yeah I guess I'll just say a couple of things about, <clears throat> I mean, um, you know, I guess sort of this practicality of the, of the knowledge is like something that I think about a lot. Um, although being sort of in like a very traditional academic position, um, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm still sort of responsible for basically publishing papers and putting out knowledge that other academics are going to read, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, when it comes down to thinking about end user, that's sort of what I'm often thinking about is like, okay, you know, curating the data, having the metadata, having, um, you know, the code available, producing uh, tools, um, you know, for academics to use, you know, whatever products I'm working on. Um, even though, you know, it's like going the next step and saying, you know, providing like a nice user friendly website that a lay person can sort of click through and say, oh, here's my city, you know, let me see the birds in, in my city or whatever. Um, you know, that's like a, uh, an extra thing that unless I have sort of like a grant, um, you know, unless I sort of built into a grant, it's definitely not something that, um, you know, I sort of spend a lot of time outside of my just sort of academic work. So, um, you know, I think maybe that varies a lot uh, with, with professions, you know, people that are in more um, either agency or, uh, you know, have more of that public outreach kind of component. 
um, right, bro broader impacts. Um, but still, yeah, I mean, I think that that, you know, that sort of mindset of like, okay, I need to produce something that my, you know, future academic or, um, or other academics can, can use versus, uh, you know, my cousin or whatever that, um, you know, has no clue of what, you know, biodiversity science is, right? Those are very different end users. So, um, Ideally, we could sort of do both, but yeah, you know, it becomes a big challenge. Speaking of challenges, um, this actually brings up a really good point and is a good segue into our next question. Um, so sort of building off of this, keeping the end user in mind, Robbie, you brought up uh, curating data, making sure all the metadata are there. Um, so as we said before, biodiversity data is interdisciplinary and highly collaborative. We produced, um, so what do you think are the greatest challenges in curating this sort of data? Um, and we can start with Anne. <laughs> sure. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges in curating interdisciplinary data or curating biodiversity data through an interdisciplinary perspective is that every disciplinary kind of looks at data looks at problems with different emphases and it's i like to bring up the old-fashioned story of the blind men and the elephant right so the, it's for those of you who don't know it's a bunch of blind men who are they each have one hand on an, a different part of an elephant and they're saying the elephant is shaped you know the, one of them's touching the ear another's touching the trunk another's touching the tail right and they're saying the elephant is this based solely on that one part of the elephant that they're touching. And I think that is very, uh, is a very good analogy for how people sort of look at biology or biodiversity, that they're each touching that one part of the elephant and saying, this is what, this is what's happening, or this is what's, what it is. Um, and, and we really need some sort of data infrastructure like models or um, some sort of, of data infrastructure that can help us take all those individual pieces of the elephant and attach them together so that they can see the whole elephant. Um, and I think that's that's one of the, the challenges is, is creating those infrastructures and those standards that can help bring those different perspectives together in a, in a coherent way. Well, others are being shy, so uh, I will say uh, <laughs> that I completely agree with Anne. I mean, I, I, I agree that we need infrastructures and services that are, you know, cross-disciplinary, that, that are available to all of us, that we all know something about somehow and can benefit from. Um, I think that's a definite lack. The, the other one for me that, that always stands out is data quality. Uh, data quality is a major problem that you know, crosses all disciplines. We all have it uh, in our silos, but we also have expertise that can help others clean uh, in various ways. And of course, it's very different to have the expertise to deal with geolocation, georeferencing versus taxonomy. These are different kinds of people. Uh, and, and, and that engagement, you know, itself has been challenging when, again, you don't have platforms or places that you can send people to do work. We're, we're getting better at that, but it, it is still pretty disjointed. Uh, and of course, as soon as you talk about data quality, you have to talk about data standards. And so we have to make sure that, you know, the standards are underpinning what the quality is we want. And then the dotted line of quality also tr goes toward trust. Trust is the social piece of this. So how do you trust the information that's provided to you? How do you assess its quality? How, how do you know anything about it? Trust goes to who are these people? Well, that's our work on agents and knowing something about you know, who these people are uh, being led by people like David Shorthouse. And you know, then it's the case of, even if I know who the people are, what have they done? What, how, what can I know about them? How, have they been attributed to doing data quality uh, of high quality? Well, if they have, then I can trust that. There's some evidence behind it. So there's this really nice string. And I think one of the nice things that we've done is 
create these people who exist again in that middle layer, the data scientists coming from information science. We critically need that layer of people whose job it is to bring the different expertise together and try and harmonize that layer for us. I'll just add, you know, sort of the, this issue of, um, you know, automation is wonderful. And it's like, you know, I've worked on a lot of life history data. And so it's like, okay, yeah, we have ginormous life history data sets with, you know, uh, tens of thousands of vertebrates now. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is, is, is pretty automated in terms of how it's sort of pulled together, but yet this issue of sort of consistency and definitions, you know, what's lifespan compared to generation time, um, so, you know, sort of just like balancing the sort of automation side with, uh, you know, standards and, and quality definitions and also quality data, it often comes down to, okay, yeah, we have thousands of species, which we have, you know, some life history data for, very few of them, you know, meet certain criteria if you want to sort of critically define what generation time is and things like that. So, um, it's always sort of a an issue I deal with being both sort of a, a theoretical ecologist as well as like a macroecologist that wants to be able to use lots and lots and lots of data, but yet, um, yeah, this issue of sort of quality and just how much can be automated that we can trust versus, you know, how much sort of a um, uh, hands-on, um, uh, you know, expertise sorting through needs to go into these kinds of data sets too, so. So I think that there, there are two different kinds of, um, I guess, interdisciplinary situations that we're talking about here is, uh, so we have one situation where you're sort of, you're trying to reuse someone else's data. You're trying to get to know how that data was, was collected. You're trying to get to know the person who collected it, their credentials. But on the other hand, you have these teams where you're actually working with the other person who uh, who collected these data and you can maybe day to day ask them, you know, why did you choose to name it this way? Why did you analyze it this way? Um, and I'm wondering in your experience, have you seen those differences? Like if you're on the same team as somebody team uh, project, do you think that that helps support that sort of, uh, trust as Jane was saying, James was saying, um, that sort of, um, interpersonal interaction. Yeah, I think so. It Sorry. definitely gives you an immediate shared use case to work around and frame your your um, your uh, collaboration around. So that makes things a little bit easier. Yeah, and I've noticed. Yeah, it's like you know, um, often become very open and collaborative about data sets and at least trying try to provide knowledge, you know, for other people. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's sort of, I don't, you know, whether it's sort of a uh, intentional or not, you know, our sort of our, our human biases, we, we sometimes get to, you know, we sort of take that switch from being sort of hypercritical. If it's like, okay, I'm trying to use your data set. Um, I'm being hypercritical about it because I can't figure out certain things versus like over collaborating on it. So then yeah, you know, it's like we have a more healthy relationship of, oh, I can just sort of ask you or we can, you know, we have a regular time that we meet. Um, but yeah, having that more openness in terms of, uh, you know, maybe it's sort of um, uh, sort of a subconscious bias kind of thing, right? It's like, oh, someone's being critical of my data set. But yeah, so I think, you know, for healthier reasons, um, having that open conversation and even inviting collaboration on these kinds of projects is often, um, mutually beneficial. Something that was mentioned and it's kind of relevant to some of the questions that are being asked here in Q&A, uh, we, we talk about these interdisciplinary work as projects. So, you know, there are different kinds of projects that people work on. And then James mentioned funding, right? There's uh, government funding, 
uh, federal funding for that. And then there, we may need different types of expertise, which is sort of temporary, right? You need that for cleaning certain type of data and then you don't need that anymore, which implies shorter term of this type of work. And then, you know, and who was someone asked about a viable career path for participants in interdisciplinary projects. And again, to me, it, it's, it speaks to the shorter term engagements in these projects. So we get together around some type of data or some type of goal, we do that and then what the team disbands and, and then what happens to people, right? Where they go uh, if they're not in some stable career where they can do whatever they want and engage in multiple projects, right? So do people have thoughts on that or can comment on that? Well, I mean, I can say that, you know, I, I agree. There, there's a couple pieces of this, right? I think one of, the, one of those is the funders themselves and the flexibility that they allow for collaborative research. For instance, one of the barriers that many of us know is we do things in country silos. So you get funding in your country, you can't share that with, it, with other people in other countries. You can try to convince them to collaborate with you for free on other projects, you know, resources that they might have. But, you know, when you're doing especially globally based things, uh, that isn't very helpful. Uh, and so, you know, the, our funders themselves need to be more flexible. And I think the other side of this is training. So to young people coming into our science, well, yes, you know, they, they come in to temporary positions, either as students or, or you know, um, positions associated with projects, they get trained up and sometimes we're able to keep them if we're creative, but many times we're not. Uh, and, you know, those funding cycles are three, four, five years. And so unlike the good old days where you got your one job and you stayed in it, uh, these days you have to be more transient and, and prepared to move around a bit, which in a lot of cases is great. It really, you know, you get different experiences and eventually you will land in that permanent place, but you have to be a little bit flexible. So I think we're trading skills. These projects are great. They're collaborative. Hopefully we build the kinds of people we need as they move from place to place and become stable. In the context of data, it seems the universities are not always um, the ideal place to store long-term data for that very reason, that there's students to come in and out on cycles, right? Whereas the national labs and museums, and especially the national labs for big you know, data models and big huge repositories, they have long-term staff. There's not as much turnover, right? It's long-term funding's there, it's federal Department of Energy or something. And so it's, it's, it's across the board, they have the facilities and there's no training, you're there and you're there. I mean, there's a few people, but basically it's, it's really long-term employees that are out there. And so, and they make ideal candidates for that kind of thing, but establishing roles, but then at the same time, having those people in that one position for a very long time and not having transit also has other effects, right? And so the universities are sometimes better at these things, but national labs are better at long-term data preservation, but not necessarily research, right? It's more the you know, back and forth collaborative activity. And so learning those roles seems to sort of adopt to a lot of that stuff. Um, so before we move on to our next question, uh, I feel like something that keeps coming up is this element of training. Um, and I like to think a lot about how, okay, we're thinking about training and um, training these established professionals to have all these uh, project skills, but also if we're going to have more of these interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary and collaborative projects, how, what are we doing to train the next generation of researchers, right? So I wonder if um, any of you could speak to your own experience, either mentoring someone um, on an interdisciplinary project or being mentored yourself. And I guess, yeah, <laughs> what, what has been your experience um, with that? Virtually all of the leadership training I have received, I've gotten outside of academia. Through my connections uh, when I was running my own uh, consulting company. And I'm, you know, I, I'm physically located in the Boston area. So there are lots of uh, entrepreneurial groups, lots of places where you can gain that sort of knowledge. And um, I've even um, had a, a leadership coach one-on-one, -on -one, but I haven't really had any, um, you know, when, when you 
go through the process of what like, leadership training in a university. It's basically just HR going through the process of this is what you do if somebody misbehaves. This is, you know, and um, that's not not very helpful. That's just not the kind of leadership we're we're talking about here today. Yeah, I can I can say from our angle, I mean, governments are like this, uh, you know, and diversity is a big thing to us. And so now when we put together big multidisciplinary projects, um, diversity is is part of government, like it, it, it's something you have to address. And and it's, it's great in some ways, because in, in the, the big project that we just put together here, you know, we we were conscious, not just of diversity, but but um, skill sets and and age. And so we actually brought some of the leaders in who were, you know, early professionals uh, just coming in, but acknowledging the fact that with mentorship, you know, they, they can get the opportunity to lead a piece of the puzzle. And that, you know, you're always a little bit nervous in the beginning about that, but I have to say that it's actually worked out really well because with sort of young comes enthusiasm and comes sort of a different way of thinking to people, at least in, in my generation, so it's been uh, it's been very exciting and and one of the projects I mean we had a young uh, data scientist join our group she started something called data chats which was sort of just a chance to talk about data show off tools you know do bring in some extra people from the outside and we had a very wide diversity of people join these are our, our research scientists their technicians you know various types of professionals biologists whole wide world and and our um, computer science and informatics friends and this has turned out to be a great thing uh, and people are hungry for that knowledge so you know that kind of youth and enthusiasm was really appreciated and and so I think we should be very conscious about sort of not diversity in age as well as the usual diversity factors. All right. Uh, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so moving on to our next question, sort of building on this um, curating data for reuse. Uh, so open data is an increasingly common solution to facilitate the interaction between the people who interact with data, uh, the processes that the data are subject to, as well as the tools that are used to manage and curate those data. Um, so drawing on your own experience, would you uh, describe your view on open data and in the context of biodiversity science? I'm going to call on someone if not. <laughs> well, I think I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have notes. I, I wrote notes. It's good. Um, so... <laughs> I think open data is good in principle. I think any publicly funded data first is just, it's, it's publicly funded, it should be publicly released. Um, but I think there's a long way to go in terms of quality metrics and a scoring system that it should be out there, but there be, should be disclaimers because there's a lot of issues with, with data quality and data trust and things like that and things that stem from it. And I think a, a quality metric system and more um, a better referential system, because a lot of people, you know, a lot of grad students that might collect in their grad research and then they don't want to release it till they have their thesis, for example. And so they have an embargo of a couple of years, especially in camp trips. And um, th that's perfectly legitimate, but there needs to be tighter controls on that and, and it needs to be well-defined. And obviously people want to be attributed to their work. And so that kind of thing, you know, protectionism isn't very good in economics and it's not very good in science either, but it's understandable with somebody puts a lot of their effort into it. Things like, you know, if you go in the field every summer and you're out in Utah and it's hundred degree weather and you collect data, everything, you might be a little more protected of it then if you go for a spacecraft that goes around Mars and just takes pictures, you're not really doing anything, right? You're just watching, you hope it doesn't crash. Um, a lot of grad students have had bad days when things crash, but you know, but it just automated, you get the data and it goes to the Department of Defense and you finally get the data and you sort of have it. But if you're out there collecting it, somebody might feel more particular and more protections of that because of the amount of effort they put into collecting it. And so understanding that, of uh, those issues there and understanding and, and you know, empathy for that kind of situation is really important, not just sort of a blanket. Well, everything should be, you know, screw it. Everything should be open. I think that's really, really important to do. And people are usually, if it's in their own self-interest to research their data out there, which it usually is, people tend to do it as long as the trust and the empathy is in place to handle it. Well, 
<laughs> I guess uh, I, I'm on the, well, I don't know if it's the left or the right on this. Uh, I, I'm an open by default person. Uh, to me, everything should be open. And I disagree in the sort of sense that industry and private data is not public. Uh, who paid for that? Yeah, you bought stuff that contributed to their ability to gather data and to do things that help you. So all data is public and citizens deserve an ability to learn from that data. Uh, and so I'm, I'm an open by default person, but you know, with openness comes sensitivity and there are ways that we can be open without being insensitive. And you know, Ben addressed one of those places where of course the whole academic way is publishing. And so it, it is competitive by nature. And because of that, it means silos. Uh, it means, oh no, I have to be careful with my data. I can't release it. I can only release parts of it, da, da, da. And I think that hurts us. Uh, but the only way that paradigm is gonna change is if the way we evaluate academics changes and the way that we look at highly collaborative research, especially. I see Robbie shaking his head, so I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, that, that, that's a big thing. Uh, and, and that is changing, I think, slowly. But social well, change me, is the hardest part. Let me push back a little bit. I mean, pr private industry, I mean, we do have a capital society. And if it compromises a company's business model to release their data, that's not necessarily, they can't do that, right? I mean, they have investors, they have things like this. And so the argument then becomes more against capitalism than it really would against the private industry of releasing the data. Now, there are, I know, you know what I mean? Why anybody has Facebook tomorrow? I have no idea. I, 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 I started to write an abstract about why Facebook is bad for your collection. <laughs> they just own everything. I mean, there are differences, but if it does compromise your underlying business model because of the way your business is set up and the goal of the private sector is to make money in a capitalist society, that isn't the argument more capitalism than it is the data part. I mean, it does happen, right? I mean, people do have ownership and they, they make money off their data. I mean, I've gotten solicitations for our website data. I, mean, I built on our website and that we don't give our, our website to six to third parties as I lost business opportunity. And it, I, that doesn't apply here, but but in other cases, but we're not a private company. Our goal is not to, to grow and make money, right? We're a museum. We have different priorities. And so um, I think private, and especially with medical, there's obviously you know personal information and privacy issues as well, but that's, that's a sort of a separate issue. But I think the private, but I think public by default, sure. But then what do you do about data quality? I mean, if you just release everything, then you get bad data out there and bad data infests in, you know, next to good data, sort of, you know, a negative and a positive goes to a negative, right? Um, it doesn't do very well. So what, I mean, if you at least everything, I mean, aren't you concerned about that? But if everything's out there, then you don't really know what's what. Um, is that still, is quality a big issue? I mean, is that, is there a problem there? Well, of Robbie, course. Did you have... <laughs> Go ahead, Robbie, Jim. did you have anything to add earlier? Um, well, I guess related to this, you know, just sort of uh, for academics, you know, especially the rise in, um, and data papers, I think, is is uh, it's sort of a good thing, right? It does provide the quality because they are peer reviewed and so forth. Um, but yeah, you know, I have an issue of yeah, you know, if I'm working on a data set uh, where I have you know undergrads in my lab recording diets of animals or whatever, right? Um, am I just going to they enter data this week? You know, we're we just going to put it on the web immediately? No, um, because I. You know, it's like they might be, uh, you know, not just starting in the lab, not trained very well. There's, you know, some iterations that we need to go through. So, um, so yeah, this issue of like, you know, building some of these data sets, certainly people like to like, you know, they sit on them and, and publish on them a little bit. Uh, I think that that is being, um, uh, those options are sort of being closed in the sense that more reviewers and editors are requiring the data to be published or the data to be, uh, you know, made available. Um, but yeah, I mean, I like that sort of review process as the, uh, you know, gatekeeper at least to some degree in terms of releasing what information does get made available um, on these kinds of data projects. Well, I think we have to, you, you have to acknowledge COVID, right? I mean, COVID has given us the best example we have of how silos do damage to things that could have gone better. And, you know, the, the data wasn't available. If it had it have been open or not even necessarily open, but had anybody had any idea that it existed somewhere, 
uh, that would have helped a lot, right? We, we're learning those lessons. Governments are changing the way they do business because of it. Uh, and so for us, I mean, our, our community, I think this has been one of the best things that could have happened to us in some ways, simply because it's forced a change of, of mindset and it's forced citizens to get engaged. Excellent points. Um, you know, do we have questions from the audience on this topic? Oh, you're still muted. Oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, so not specifically on this topic, but we have some questions that, you know, people post on Whova, and I don't know if we should just allow people to ask these questions or should I read them? So I mentioned, you know, the career path. I think we kind of talked about it. There was something about data standards and the question about which provenance preservation standards help with data governance efforts and collaboration projects. And there were several mentioned like premise, prov, prop one, et cetera. I don't know if uh, we wanna comment or talk about that. Standards is a usually big and sensitive topic. And <laughs> um, so I, I can just mention Actually, a few others. I, I would say that standards are not the problem, right? Standards are highly technical and, and uh, purposeful. It's the implementation of them and, and the sort of understanding of them that is the problem. <laughs> And then I think there was a question that is sort of related to big data and scalability. And then, yeah, there, there, there are also some interesting comments. You know, there's a chat going. So we have these two platforms, right? We have Zoom and we also have Whova and th there is chat happening there. Um, but yeah, scalability of projects and big data and sort of relate the relationship to interdisciplinarity and then like when everything goes beyond our own computers, right? And we can't work with data on our own computers anymore. And uh, we had some interesting examples of that in our projects where there, there seem to be several approaches. Like some people say, well, I'll just buy bigger computers and I will still download all the data. <laughs> I will still work uh, using my local desktop, uh, but then, at some point, it, it stops being feasible, right? Especially when you collaborate with other people. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, I'm part of this uh, big research university and the teams that we work with, they are not aware, aware of options that are available to them through uh, the university. Uh, you, and I understand that, you know, other places may not have options for uh, collaborative big data research in cloud services. Yeah, but it's, is it about awareness? Is it about, you know, outreach and, and support for these projects? Uh, what else? Well, in my world, it's complicated. Gover governments make things complicated because of their security and protectiveness, you know, which is important. Um, but being highly collaborative means you can't have those silos and it means access, right? You have all the players have to be able to access the resources required. And, and that has been a great challenge uh, in, in my world. But at least the cloud services now, uh, you know, pay to play sort of understanding it is complex still, but at least it gives us neutral playgrounds, uh, sandboxes. Uh, and I think that's great. The answer that isn't great, though, still is the archiving is, is the where do these things live on that, you know, so others can benefit from them. We cite these things. There's expectation, right? We put identifiers on these things. There's expectation that we'll be able to find this 20 years from now. Uh, that's still a real challenge for us. Uh, and big data makes it even worse because it's trying to store big images, big sequences, uh, you know, except for the generosity of a couple governments that, that are footing the bill on some of these bigger problems, it, we still are nowhere near the scale we need. And th those are grand challenges. So 
I, I'm listening to, to, to these challenges and, and I'm thinking to some of the projects that I'm on that have more of a biomedical focus that are dealing with a lot of these challenges. And I think that there are possibly some techniques um, that we can bring over from that discipline and in, into biodiversity to handle like the cloud computing, the access, the security, the preservation and um, the uh, multimodal data analytics that, that we're looking for. All right, we have uh, quite a few questions in the Q&A on Whova. Um, and I think that because there are a lot of questions, uh, we can probably start moving to audience Q&A. Um, and so if I'm reading this correctly, there are some that have been uploaded. Um, so I guess we'll, we can start with this first one uh, by Nikki Nicholson. Um, how can we ensure a viable career path for the participants in interdisciplinary projects who might not be progressing through the traditional research career stages? So I think so this one we kind of talked about, I mentioned it yeah. earlier, oh, okay. right? I see, I see, I see. So maybe I should mark it as answered. Yeah. <laughs> okay, since you, since you have been watching it, would you... Um, all right, yeah, so maybe this one, what role does community building play in transdisciplinary work? And it's Abigail and she refers to yesterday's last session of the day, if people were part of that discussion. And in chat, I think someone mentioned community curation, which I liked uh, this comment. So community, well, community curation is, is a great example, right? Where that comes back to the, the thing I talked about earlier of, you know, sort of expertise. If geo-referencing, if you live in a place, right, you're probably the best person to know something about that place. So if, if you could connect to the records that are from that place, you, you would be good at that. Same with things like taxonomy. If you're an expert in that small piece of the puzzle that is you, well, anything that about that small piece of the puzzle hopefully makes it to you so you have a chance to look at it. So your expertise uh, is there. Trouble is the gaps, right? Um, but I, I really think we, we have to be able to have systems that give access to our data and allow people to help curate it uh, at quality, give or take the trust issues. So I think we mentioned, yeah, another question, an interesting question. We talked about data papers. Someone mentioned data papers. So the question to panelists is uh, the traditional way to integrate and review ideas and outcomes uh, is through scholarly communication and publication. What is your experience in reviewing or publishing data heavy multidisciplinary works? Can you point to specific example? I like specific examples. <laughs> Um, I can provide some experience, I guess. Uh, I find it oftentimes, okay, so, uh, just like dealing with lots of, um, sort of heterogeneous data and global data, uh, oftentimes, and, you know, you, you can submit to a journal, <laughs> you often get sort of expertise on different parts of that. And it's like, okay, we have a collaborative team that's bringing, um, you know, very different data sets together. And then you get experts on each of those. And so that can often be a real challenge um, uh, because they, you know, they haven't sort of looked at the, you know, sort of the combination of all of them. They're sort of nitpicky about certain, uh, you know, the data sets that they're aware of. Um, on the reviewer side, I think the same thing can kind of come up. And I think um, that's where we have to be honest about sort of like what we actually know and what we don't know and sort of communicate that to the editor um, to say, yeah, you know, it's like, I'm, I understand and I'm knowledgeable about the biodiversity data that they use with this, but you know, the, 
the Landsat data or whatever, it's something that I'm not familiar with. You need other expertise to be, be able to weigh in. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that uh, I think, you know, we're not really trained to review papers that well in general, but, um, but being sort of, you know, honest about that and not like, okay, yeah, I just sort of, you know, I'm being asked to review this. I'm the expert on everything. It's, you know, oftentimes you're sort of an expert on just a little bit that's related to the project. So um, I think that's something to sort of keep in mind, but, and then sort of extensions in the policy, I guess, like I was involved in a paper that was published in Nature this past year on um, drought, uh, fire and policy impacts on in the Amazon. Um, and it was like the most uh, strenuous review process for this issue of having like five or six reviewers with different, with expertise on different components of this. Um, and it went through so many iterations. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, on the collaboration side, having that open communication and making sure that we are, you know, it's not just at the end of the day, one person ends up submitting and doing a lot of the correspondence. So it's like, okay, this involved a lot of different expertise, a lot of different data sets. We really need to, uh, you know, collectively be able to address these kinds of reviews. Um, and that sort of persistence too, I think becomes challenging because yeah, it has become a very difficult, uh, you know, in terms of where to find outlets, where to get appropriate reviewers and making sure that, um, uh, you know, there's, your reviewers are reviewing adequately as well as your responses are addressing with their concerns too. Well, I think it's something we struggle with in our, you know, depending on how you interact, right? If you're a pure academic, you have to play the pure academic game. If you're, what do I call us, uh, impure academic? No, uh, whatever we are, uh, we struggle because we're not evaluated, which is kind of good uh, in a completely academic way. Yes, publication is important, but the data we produce is also valued and the software we produce is also valued. And the last two are harder to evaluate for managers. It's not as easy to say, well, what was the impact of X? Uh, and so, you know, again, this is a paradigm shift. It's happening in academics too. I'm sure you see that, Robbie. And, but, but it's hard because it's not, it's not as clear how to evaluate data generated or work done on data, you know, that integration even worse. Uh, and then the software, well, here's my GitHub repo. I've got a million lines of code. Well, so what? D does anybody use it? Uh, you know, how many, oh, how many people have done a pull request? Okay, good. You know, this is the, this is the space we're in now and it has to shake out. It is shaking out, but it's interesting times. Yeah, re related in the chat, I see that the question about, um, you know, would you have time to review all the data in every paper? Um, <laughs> it is really challenging. Oftentimes, you know, it's sort of, uh, I do, you know, if I, like I see what references, you know, where the data coming from and then do sort of a spot check to sort of get an idea of, okay, I'm familiar with these aspects. How do they sort of shake out in this study? Um, that can sort of give an, an idea. The other issue is this, you know, like there's often a lot of papers that are submitted that synthesize or harmonize a lot of different data sets and sort and you know, like comparative data across species. And they, you know, they don't want to provide the data set in the review process. They have some language that they intend on publishing it or whatever to be provided as a supplemental. But right, as a reviewer, how can you assess the quality of the, of the data set um, in that situation? So again, that's something that, you know, hopefully like our exchange with editors, I hope, you know, maybe that increases as being more of a conversation instead of just like, okay, you send me this thing. I just sort of send comments back to this black hole. Um, but having this back and forth of saying, you know, I really need to be able to see the data uh, to review this paper and um, instead of, you know, sort of the traditional way that we often go about reviewing things, so. And, you know, even well, also the data and the code too, right? It's like, I should be able to reproduce what you 
have in your figures if you give me the data and the code. Um, so yeah, people are still very reluctant to provide those in the review process. Well, and that touches on something that we didn't talk about, which is very important, and that's provenance. So I know, you know, you're very interested in workflows and such. And so the provenance of those workflows is critical. And, and provenance is not something to be taken trivially. It is not easy to do, and especially to do really well. Uh, I, I've had some engagement with academics as part of projects I've been in, and it just... Well, it hurts my head a little bit, but uh, it's a space we need to do better in, right? And again, this is that interdisciplinary piece. But for repeatability, it's not just about the data. It's about what did you do to the data? And, and that path can be long in certain things. And one of the troubles is it can be long and there can be black boxes along the way using algorithms that aren't available or that pieces of software that don't really explain what they do well. So. You know, we that that's a piece, you know, that I think is is critical as well. That's true. Yeah, and some some challenge that that we're you know seeing in our project is yeah, obviously some software tools were not designed to support provenance, and they're still in use, a lot of them, and how to address that and what to do with it. I think yeah, it's it's a big question. I agree. Yeah. I think the molecular world has maybe the best start at it uh, just because they do try to explain what they did and they have a lot of transformative, transformative steps. But I think ecology too um, is making strides there. So we're getting close to 11. I think we have like a few minutes left. Kimberly, do we want some concluding remarks? Uh, I wish we could, yeah, somehow combine the chats <laughs> in these different platforms and have sort of a joint conversation. And I'm, yeah, I apologize if I didn't read all the questions. I think I tried to incorporate many of them as much as I could. Yeah, um, I, I guess we can also use this as a reminder that in Whova you can start a little mini uh, meeting room if you would like to discuss these um, items further. So um, I recommend folks do that if you're interested in discussing this even more. Um, there have been a lot of really great comments in the chat on Zoom and Whova. Um, yeah, I think that we've touched on a lot <laughs> today. Uh, there's a lot to digest. Um, and I guess I, I just thank the panelists, you know, to for taking time out of their days um, and contributing to this very uh, multi-dimensional discussion. Um, Ina, do you have any concluding remarks? No, but th yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, that's a really interesting discussion. It's always fun to talk about these things. Thank you for inviting me to the panel. Yes, likewise. Very interesting. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>